First of all, I want to thank you for being here. I really do appreciate it. My name is Scott Davis. I feel like I have broken the rules. This is the vendor track. And the stuff I'm going to talk to you about, I can't sell you. It's all free and open source. So if you want to file your complaints up front, please do. No money can be exchanged hands for this. But I think you will be excited about the technology I'm going to show you today. As I said, my name is Scott Davis. I'm a principal engineer with uh, ThoughtWorks. We have lots of ThoughtWorks kind of wandering around. You've probably seen our name on, on the uh, a non-existent badge I was about to reach for here. Um, there are going to be another other, a number of other thought workers giving talks here throughout uh, QCon. But um, let me start. Let me take a, a, a quick uh, a survey. How many of you, this is your first time at QCon? Nice, nice. A lot of first timers. Are you enjoying yourself so far? Yeah? Good. All right. Notice I asked you that at the beginning of my talk, not at the end of my talk. All right. Yeah, I know. I know. Um, but I am a, I'm a, a principally a, a web engineer, a web architect, if you will. So I am very excited about web technologies. Uh, I graduated from university in 1993, and Netscape Navigator 2.0 came out in 1995. Navigator 2 is pretty important because it not only introduced the world to JavaScript, it was the very first browser that had JavaScript support, it was also the browser that introduced the world to Java through applets. So if you can imagine fresh out of university, rather than ready to take on the world, and this browser has kind of dropped on my lap, and that has really informed my career ever since. Uh, my first book for O'Reilly was JBoss at Work, so I spent a number of times doing back-end uh, web development in, in uh, ASP, in Java, in Perl, CGI, right? A lot of that good back-end stuff. I spent a number of years in Groovy and Grails. Any of you use Groovy and Grails? Oh, I just love it, don't you? Yeah, so much fun. Uh, look at me, my haircut. Uh, it's, are anyone surprised that I'm a guy who is into a programming language called Groovy? Probably not. Probably not. Um, but about uh, um, 2004 or so, I had the opportunity to work on Google Maps um, when it was pre-released, before it was released uh, to the general public. Now, not as a Googler, but working for a satellite imaging company. In the early days of Google Maps, if you ever flipped into satellite imagery mode and looked at your backyard, those were our pixels. So it was kind of fun getting a chance to work on that. And it was eye-opening for me. Because as a back-end Java developer, I had drunk the Kool-Aid. I was told by no one less than Brendan Eich, the inventor of JavaScript, that Java was for serious programmers, for professionals, right? And JavaScript is for hobbyists, amateurs, hackers, if you will, yeah. Um, and Google Maps was the first application that convinced me otherwise, that, oh my goodness, there is a real programming language in here. There's a real market for framework-free, browser-native, standards-compliant web development. And so that's what I want to talk a little bit about here today, but we're going to talk about it in the context of testing. So there are two actually free and open source products I want to talk about. Each one is great on their own, but I really truly believe that one plus one equals three when it comes to these two together. Gage is a user journey testing tool. Now you see, even on our own website, we've misspelled user journey testing. We've called it acceptance testing. You're probably familiar with acceptance testing. You've probably seen the testing pyramid where user journey testing or user acceptance testing is right up there at the top of the pyramid, not at the bottom, not at the foundation. And there are a number of reasons why when Mike Cohn uh, came up with that testing uh, uh, pyramid, uh, uh, he's a friend of mine, we're both from Denver, Colorado. When he came up with that pyramid, it was because what was at the tip of that pyramid, those user journey tests, those user acceptance tests, were typically the slowest to run and the flakiest to run. Wow, everyone's nodding their head. Really? You've experienced that same pain? Yeah. And so as a consequence, most people didn't have a pyramid, but more of a plateau, right? Um, they said, well, no, 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 that, that user acceptance testing, we'll get around to it sooner or later. Um, Gage actually changes that, and Tycho changes that as well. But what's exciting about Gage is that we absolutely can use this to begin doing user journey tests or tests in the 
language of the user rather than the language of the developer. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. Um, Tycho is the other piece of this equation. Now, Tycho is a browser driver, if you will. It's in JavaScript, it's in Node.js. We can see you npm install Tycho and away you go. But this is a nice high level DSL that allows you to do things like open a browser and go to a URL and click on a button. And it sounds like I'm speaking in pseudocode, but in fact, that is the high level DSL or domain specific language that Tycho brings to the party. So if you think about these two now being put together, what we end up with is Gage, which is a test runner that makes it easy to express your tests in the language of the user. And then you have Tycho, which is a browser automation tool that allows you to do easy things like open a new tab, click on this field, fill in a value, and of course make assertions on that. You begin seeing that we've got a really lovely combination of technologies that work incredibly well together. So, I want to give you a little bit of background but the demo gods seem to have been pleased with all the speakers here, so I'm actually going to give you some live code uh, demos in there as well. I'm a programmer. I've mentioned that I'm a web architect, but I firmly believe that an architect who doesn't code is like a chef who doesn't eat, right? And so I definitely want to show you this code because it's easy for people to put up PowerPoint slides and show you how easy it is, right? But I really want to prove it to you in code. And the good news is we have three hours, so we've got all the time in the world, right? Uh, we don't have three hours, but we have plenty of time to make our, make our way through these things. So again, some background and then live code. Um, but this idea of user journey testing, Martin Fowler is our chief scientist at ThoughtWorks. Um, and so he's really good at defining things and coming up with terms to describe the common things that we do. We like calling that a ubiquitous language. And so when we talk about acceptance testing, there's really nothing wrong with that term. Really the idea is we want the users to accept this code that we've done. We've already written all of our unit tests, right? Y'all have 100% code coverage? We don't need to cover that, right? Yeah, of course, yes. And if you think about that base level of the pyramid, that is really all about the developer experience. And I'm not saying that like it's a bad thing. I'm a developer myself. But those unit tests are of the developer, by the developer, for the developer. So if you think about maybe we're at a grocery store website and I'm trying to put bananas in a shopping cart, trying to put bananas in a basket, as a user, I would say I want to put bananas in the basket. As a developer, though, I'm like, got it, all right. So you want to put UPC strings in a collection. Or even more so, you just want to put strings in an array. And while it sounds like we're speaking the same language and testing the same thing and achieving the same results, there's something very different about putting strings in an array and bananas in a basket. Does that make sense? And I'm not arguing semantics here. I really am talking about the language we use. Language is powerful. And so what I like about this term, user journey testing, is that it starts with the user. It brings the user back into the conversation, actually leads with the user. Because if you ask most developers what step one of the process is, they'll probably say something like, oh, pick a framework set up a git repo, set up a CI CD pipeline, something along those lines, right? If you're familiar at all with design thinking, step one in design thinking is empathy. And that's crucial. That's crucial to begin thinking about how your user is going to use this website, how your user is going to consume this app, what the user is going to do to interact with these things. And so this is why I like calling Gage and Tycho a user journey testing suite, because we're really focused on the user 
first in how they're going to experiment, how they're going to explore, how they're going to interact with your website. Another way of thinking about this is kind of black box, white box testing, right? Uh, unit tests are almost by definition white box because you're the developer in the code making sure that you're not throwing null pointer exceptions or things like that. But no user is ever going to say, ah, when I put that banana in the basket, I hope I don't get a user exception. I hope I don't get a null pointer exception. I hope I don't get a non-error back, right? Um, and so this idea of user journey testing and bringing the user back in the language is what's critical about this. And the reason I'm spending so much time on this is when I'm talking about testing, and again, speaking to myself as a developer, a lot of times say, okay, Scott, yeah, thanks. We're all full up on testing libraries right now. We got Jest, we've got Mocha. We've got chai, we've got these kinds of things. And this is great. I want to tell you right now, I don't want to replace those libraries. In fact, I want you to continue doing all the unit testing you are doing in the testing framework that you're using. This doesn't replace Jest for React developers. This doesn't replace Mocha for, uh, or uh, Jasmine, excuse me, for uh, Angular developers. Um, this really is a whole different kind of testing that should augment your existing test, not replace. Does that make sense? Yeah? All right, good. Now, ThoughtWorks has a long history of doing this user-focused testing. You might have heard of behavior-driven development. That was a statement. That's really a question. Good, good, good. You might have heard of Cucumber. Yeah, Gherkin, wonderful. These are all ThoughtWorks projects from way back. We see back in 2003, Dan North started talking at conferences like QCon about behavior-driven development. Now, he did that initially in the context of Java with jbehave, but later on he ended up porting that to Ruby and we got rbehave, and then of course we have someone else beginning to talk about Cucumber and Gherkin which again, is just fun to say, right? Um, but you can see that we've got over 15 years of history of doing this kind of user-focused testing. So this is what Cucumber looks like. And believe it or not, I'm actually a fan of Cucumber. Um, I really do like being able to say, given, when, then, because it gives us that developer mentality. It makes us starting to think about inputs and outputs or stimulus and response. And so as a developer, when I read through this, all right, my scenario is Eric wants to withdraw money, given Eric has a valid credit card and his account balance is 100, when he sticks it in, then he'll get the money back. This is a really nice rubric to kind of make you think about the possible steps that they would go in and the stimulus response. How many of your users express their user stories in this kind of language, right? This is almost like haiku, and I like haiku as well. But there's a very structured way of dealing with haiku that's very different than just kind of everyday conversations. And so if you take this plain English approach, and I'm saying English because these happen to be written in English, right? It doesn't have to be English. But if you take this plain spoken way of expressing your tests, and capture that, this is what Gage offers us. So Gage, in fact, has scenarios as well, specifications and scenarios, but in fact, they're implemented in Markdown. That's Markdown, right there. So my uh, uh, spec is I want to count vowels. That's a header one, a single hash up there as well. All my scenarios underneath there are double hashes, or H2s, if you think of it in terms of the web. And you can see these asterisks are, in fact, the steps you take for your various scenarios. So we've lost the given when then, and I'm using that language intentionally. We have lost that intellectual rigor of cucumber, but what we have given us instead is a way to absolutely freeform express our expectations in the language of the user. 
And so if I say, oh, vowels in the English language are A, I, O, U, oh, here are the words with vowels and we can see in a table format we can begin counting these particular vowels, we've now begun expressing these user journey tests in the language of the user in Markdown. So all of a sudden we don't have to worry about Gherkin and custom parsers. We find that Markdown parsers are ubiquitous, they're everywhere, so it's very easy to begin expressing ourselves in Markdown. The drawback is this isn't executable, right? Um, so how do we actually begin doing the steps and gauge is absolutely non-denominational. Gauge allows you to implement your specs in JavaScript or C Sharp or Java or Python or Ruby. So what we end up finding here is when I have individual steps like vowels in the English language are, and I go back and look at vowels in the English language are, we begin seeing how we're able to tie this specification and markdown to an implementation in JavaScript just by pattern matching, just by that string being matched. And you can see we can insert variables in here when we say our vowels, that gets handed into the function vowels given and then we can turn around and use it internally. When we have a table like words with vowels and we have a table with a word and a vowel count in there, we're able to match up words with vowels, pass in a table, and then iterate through that table row by row. Now I'm showing you JavaScript because it's the only example that will fit on a single slide. <laughs> Java and C Sharp, of course, are a bit more um, verbose, shall we say. Um, but what's nice about this is that Java is, in fact, one of the most popular languages used behind Markdown because there are a whole bunch of Java projects out there that like using this. So all of a sudden, we can begin using Gage in the language of our application if that's what we want to do. But when I'm out talking to customers, I'm saying, how about instead you use the language that your testers are most comfortable with. This effectively separates these two. Your unit tests, of course, have to be written in Java to consume the Java APIs, or Ruby to consume the Ruby APIs, or so on and so forth. What Gage gives us the ability to do is kind of separate those concerns. And if you find yourself in a language that's more expressive, like Groovy, like Python, like Ruby, something along those lines, you can absolutely write your tests in the language of choice that is independent of the application's language. Does that make sense? Yeah? Very good. Very good. And of course, we wouldn't be complete if we didn't have pretty reports to get out of the back end. So once again, we see vowels in the English language are E-I-O-U, the word gauge has three vowels, and so on and so forth. So what we have now is a spec that's implemented in Markdown. The implementations are in the language of your choice. Tycho is JavaScript based. We're going to talk about JavaScript today. And then we have reports showing us not only how many passed and failed and skipped, but also the execution time of each one of those kinds of things as well. What questions do you have so far? Does this make sense? Yeah? Lovely. So if you wanted to install Gage, I'm not going to do that for you live right now, but it is pretty straightforward. We've got full platform support, so whatever platform you're on, whatever language you're trying to target, and we've got really nice IDE support. I'll pull up Visual Studio Code here in just a moment, even though I do most of my development in VI. Um, some of the really nice IDE enhancements around Gage, being able to run individual specs or running the whole test suite right from your IDE is... Uh, a pretty compelling reason. <laughs> I end up pulling up Studio Code just to run my test, which is the opposite of what most people do. They write their code in an IDE and then run their test from a command line, and I do almost the opposite. But let's assume that this thing has actually been installed. If we wanted to, in fact, create a brand new project. All right, here we go. Live testing time. We are in uh, San Francisco, right? So I'll do this. All right. Nothing up my sleeve, right? Empty blank directory that we just created right here. So in order to initialize a new gauge project, we're going to type in gauge init. 
Oh, uh, and what language do we need? Um, in my case, I'm going to be using Tycho, so this would be a short presentation if I didn't do gauge init.js. Now you'll see this is coming down in a separate directory. A lot of times I like keeping my unit tests in the same directory as my code base. I like keeping my user journey tests in a separate repo. Again, if they're separate languages, that makes a lot more sense. But even so, this is something that I could have this code base on my laptop and I could have this production code somewhere else. Hey, successfully initialized the project. Yay. So we can see that it downloaded Chromium with it. That is Tycho in action. So act surprised when I tell you that Tycho uses Chromium under the hood. All right, oops, I didn't want to do that. Here we go. So here is my new uh, um, uh, gauge project right here. If I look in the specs directory, I'll see there's an example spec in there. If I look in the tests directory, I can see there's my implementation in JavaScript right now. We'll dive into that code, I promise you. But I just did a gauge init JavaScript. I'm going to do a gauge run. And we'll see what it does is it pops up a browser, it types in something in a field, it presses enter, yay, test passed. All right, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed yourself, right? I got to quit while I'm ahead. There's some point this is going to fail, but since we succeeded, I'll stick with this. Let's turn around and see what this looks like in an IDE. All right, so let's start not right now. Thank you, though. So let's turn around and take a look at what the spec looks like. Once again, this is Markdown. We can see hashes say, hey, I want to get started with Gage. Any notes that I want to write are just freeform text in here, so I don't have to do anything magical about that at all. But when I'm trying to go in and search the Tycho repository, this is where these steps become really interesting. These are, in fact, not an unordered list. These are an ordered list, an OL with a bunch of LIs in HTML think. Because what I want to do is I want to go to the Git Gage GitHub page. I want to search for Tycho, and I want to make sure that that contains this string. Yeah? Now, there's nothing executable about that. But what I've done is I've expressed the intent of my tests in the language of the user. This is where I could turn around and use Java or C Sharp or Python, or Ruby. In fact, what I'm going to do is use Tycho in here. We can see Tycho gets pulled in, required in. We're also just using the plain old Node.js npm assert library. This is where we could bring in any assertion library we want. Um, but for right now, I just want to do some assert OK kind of things. So we can see things going on like, all right, cool. I'm going to open up a browser before each suite runs. Once I've got a browser open, all right, if I want to go to this GitHub page, I can go to this particular URL. What I really like about Tycho is it is modern JavaScript. This is ES6 JavaScript with async and await. These are promises, right? but wrapped in a little bit of syntactic sugar, which means, yeah, um, going to Git Gauge is going to take some time. It could take milliseconds. It could take seconds, hopefully not more than that. But what's going on here is that we have this async await baked into the framework. So every single one of these steps are going to take is exactly as long as they take and no longer. If any of you done any Selenium work, I have never seen your test before, right? How many sleeps do you have in your Selenium tests? I'm not judging because I have to do them as well. A lot, right? Um, because Selenium, I'm not here to knock Selenium at all, but Selenium is this external kind of third party kind of thing. And so what we have to do is wait for these things to occur. And so in fact, we end up sleeping and sleeping and sleeping, which is really unfortunate if it takes 100 milliseconds to execute and you're sleeping for five seconds. That's highly inefficient. So what we wanted to do instead is make sure this runs as fast as possible. You can see down here we're going to search for a query which gets passed in. What is our query in this case? OK, we want to search for Tycho as we go along. And so what this means is we're going to focus on the text box to the right of pricing. Wow, 
That's a heck of a DSL, isn't it? Any questions about what that thing does? Yeah, this is Tyco in action right here. Once we focus on that text box to the right of pricing, we're going to type in whatever gets passed in as our query, and we're going to press enter. Here's our assertion library, test without assertions. No, we got to assert, right? And so here we're going to make sure that, hey, the text content exists on that particular page. What's really nice about separating out our markdown from our JavaScript is you can begin seeing reuse in here. If we're constantly visiting GitHub, this search for query is now reusable. We can turn around and use this on, on any other things. We could turn around and begin searching for you know, Gage or Tyco or any other libraries on GitHub that we're interested in. Similarly, making sure that page contains content, this is incredibly reusable. So a lot of times people say, well, how come we don't get the JavaScript for free? How come I have to write the markdown and the JavaScript? Well, it's because as you write more markdown, you won't be writing a corresponding amount of JavaScript. At some point, your markdown is going to be several multiples of the actual language you have in your code base because hopefully you're looking for opportunities to reuse. That's what programmers are best at. Yeah? So, this is what we got out of the box. And again, I typed in gauge init JavaScript, gauge test. If I want to see a report, I can certainly do that. We've got a reports directory right there. You see it? So if I open reports, we get a really pretty report, getting started with gauge, go to this page, do this, do this. And we found that it took us one second to go to that URL, about five seconds to do the search. And once that page was loaded, it was essentially free because it was already in memory. So this is really helpful as well, being able to find uh, hot spots in your test, being able to say, oh, wow, it's taking an extraordinarily long time to check out. It's taking an extraordinary long time to do a credit card validation. And that can turn around and give us uh, hints as developers to, oh, display a progress bar or make this asynchronous and let them go back or do whatever you need to do to move forward. Fair enough. Lovely. All right. Well, we're halfway done. Let's now talk about Tyco. I'm a parent. No parent's going to admit that one child is their favorite. So I wouldn't ever publicly admit that I like Tycho more than Gage, but I will hint at it. Um, what's really nice, and that's not a knock on Gage at all, but what's really nice is Tycho begins presenting so many opportunities beyond this testing. A lot of times what I will end up doing is use Tycho to go out and grab a page and then do just kind of introspection on that page. I'll use Tycho to go out and begin programmatically downloading a series of PDFs or videos or things like that. When we talk about automating the browser, Certainly testing is the killer use case for that, but there are so many other test cases for this. One of the things we'll find in Tyco is you can take screenshots. So you could go along and visit a website and just screenshot every page you visit and be done. So there is so much that you can do in Tyco outside of Gage, but even in the URL, you can tell where it came from and you can tell what its first intention was which is to back these gauge tests with this really nice, friendly, high-level DSL, domain-specific language. Now, once again, ThoughtWorks has a history of this. I mentioned Selenium previously. Some people don't realize that that's a ThoughtWorks project, um, which is really nice. Jason Huggins, back in 2004, had an internal testing tool. He named it Selenium. Do you know the backstory behind that name? Do you know why it was named Selenium? There's a very powerful, very popular, but commercial testing tool at the time called Mercury. Do you know how you cure mercury poisoning? <laughs> Selenium. Yeah. So that's cute. Yeah. So this is how you cure mercury poisoning right here. But back in 2004, we came up with this tool called Selenium. We'll see a lot of other people began contributing to it. Simon Stewart especially came up with this competing product called WebDriver. And then in 2009, these two kind of merged. Not kind of, officially merged, yeah? 
And so the deal with this is that this was incredibly powerful at the time. Being able to programmatically drive your browser. The drawback is, and you've already nodded in the affirmative, that these were historically incredibly flaky tests. And for a couple of different reasons, and this is not knocking Selenium or WebDriver or any of the work that came before us, right? This is just simply reporting on the reality of the ground. That this was written at a time 15 years ago before we had evergreen browsers constantly upgrading ourselves. And if you've worked with Selenium, you know you have to have the actual browser, and then you have to have a Selenium server over here, and then you have WebDriver in the middle, which is tied to a very specific version of that very specific browser, and it can be platform specific at times as well. So all of a sudden, if you've got a browser that is evergreen and auto-updating, it means your web driver can get out of sync, which means your tests can fail for spurious reasons. That's a bummer. We've got a solution for that in Tyco. I wouldn't have brought it up if we didn't, of course. Um, but more subtle is the flakiness of the test because how you were selecting those elements in there. As developers, as white box developers, we would build super complex CSS selector logic to reach right down into this kind of thing, typically using CSS classes or IDEs, or excuse me, IDs, and what changes all the time, IDs and CSS classes. And so not only were your tests flaky because of the evergreen browser scenario, your tests were also flaky because your underlying website was constantly changing on you. And that was what we wanted. This is, we call those new features as they roll out, right? But as the website evolves and changes, as the structure of your website changes, that would also cause your tests to fail. So. How does Tyco solve that? Well, we saw Chromium come down. When I did a gauge in it JS, I want to be very clear, I was installing gauge, but because of JS, I was installing Tyco as well. If you do an npm install Tyco, and you probably want to do it globally, so if you do an npm g Tyco, what you get pulled down is a known good version of Tyco uh, with Chromium. So it immediately eliminates that flaky, flaky browser scenario that we talked about. Now, Chromium is kind of cute uh, while we're talking about origins and things like that. So we've already talked about Selenium, how that's secure for mercury poisoning, right? So Chromium is, in fact, the element on the periodic table that allows you to make Chrome. So it makes sense that Google would call this thing Chromium that they use to build the Google Chrome browser, but we know that Chromium builds a number of other browsers besides just Google Chrome, right? Opera? Yeah, of course, we're all testing Opera, right? Yeah? But Opera, in fact, uses Chromium under the covers as well. Microsoft? Microsoft Edge now uses Chromium as well? Think about that. They just announced Linux support for Microsoft Edge. We're living in a brave new world, aren't we? <laughs> it's amazing, right? But the fact that Edge is using Chromium under the covers, the fact that Opera is using Chromium under the covers, of course, that Google Chrome is using Chromium under the covers, it means that using Chromium, we've targeted a good two-thirds of the market. And those are real numbers. Chrome. Uh, accounts for anywhere between 60 to 65 percent of the market on its own. The Microsoft browsers are low single digits and Opera is low, low single digits as well. But when we add those all up, we've got about two-thirds of the market based on Chromium right there. And it was really cool when Edge came out, we didn't have to make a change at all to Tyco. In addition to using an embedded Tyco, you can set an environment variable and you can point it to an actual browser. And so what we do regularly is we run our Tyco tests using internal Chromium, and then we turn around and rerun them again using a platform-specific installation of Google Chrome, and then we use a platform-specific installation of Opera, and then we use a platform-specific installation of Edge. 
Now that seems like it's a little bit of belts and suspenders, but of course there are different versions of Chromium in all those various browsers, and we just want to make sure that we're capturing kind of the various combinations and permutations thereof. So is this a tool where we can do remote testing on an iPhone? Nah, not yet. Safari doesn't support Chromium. It's got its own underlying uh, uh, render engine and JavaScript uh, uh, engine in there. Is this going to help us out with Firefox? Nah. But in fact, what Tycho uses is the Chrome DevTools protocols. And while they're not out and stable right now, Apple is actively working on a CDP adapter for Safari. Firefox is actively working on a CDP adapter for Firefox. So when these things come up, in fact, we will begin hitting those other browsers. And again, as simple as just setting an environment variable, we could start poking against those others right there. I wanted to bring this up because it is deeply geeky, but it also really emphasizes the stability that was really one of the number one goals of Tycho, is to eliminate that testing flakiness. CDP is, in fact, what your Chrome developer tools use. When you're in your browser and you pull up the developer tools, those are actually two separate applications. You've seen you can break it out of the window and run it separately. And when you're breaking it out of that window and running it separately, your developer tools over here are using the Chrome DevTools protocol to talk to the browser. If you've ever used Lighthouse, let me turn that around. Have you used Lighthouse? Oh, please do. Go into your developer tools right now, not right now, um, very soon, um, and go to the audit tab and run an audit, run a Lighthouse audit. It is baked into every Google Chrome browser. It gives you ridiculously informative performance numbers, numbers on accessibility, numbers on SEO search engine optimization, uh, uh, metrics on how PWA ready you are, progressive web app ready, and you get this all for free just in Google Chrome. So if you pull up the developer tools, go over to the audit tab, run an audit on whatever URL you happen to be on at the time, you are actually using Lighthouse, which is using the Chrome DevTools protocol to drive the browser. Puppeteer is really nice. Any of you use Puppeteer in here? Yeah, a couple of you are going like this. What are your thoughts? Cumbersome. It's incredibly low level. It's incredibly powerful. I'm not here to say anything bad about Puppeteer at all, but the API is very, very low level. And it's WebSocket driven. All of this stuff is streaming back and forth to the browser. As web developers, we're used to request, response, request, response. And in fact, since this is WebSocket based, I had the same experience. I could appreciate the power, but it wasn't native to me. And that's why we see Tycho using this async await because it is in fact using web sockets under the covers. It's in fact waiting for all those things to come back. But anything I can do in Puppeteer I can do in Tycho, quite literally, because we're using the same protocol. Any of the metrics I get out of Lighthouse I can get in Tycho because we're quite literally using the same pipeline as we go back and forth. So many times what I'll do is I'll find a blog entry of someone who's done this thing in Puppeteer and I'll see that it's possible, and then I'll do it in Tycho in a fraction of the lines of code. Yeah? So, the REPL. <laughs> Here's where it gets fun, right? The REPL. So now, I'm back in here right now, but I'm just going to type in Tycho. And we can see that I'm using Tycho. Can you see that all right? You want me to bump it up a little bit? Here. All right. So if I come into Tycho right now, if I, let's do this one more time. All right. So we see right now this is a REPL. A uh, REPL of, is, is, is short for read, evaluate, process, loop. Um, so a lot of major programming languages these days, Node.js, if you just type in Node, you're in a JavaScript. REPL. Ruby comes with its own REPL, Clojure comes with its own REPL, and Tycho, in fact, does as well. I can see what version of Chromium I have right now. It tells me I have two options to type in. One will make this a very short presentation, and the other will give us an idea of what we can do. 
So what's nice about this is these are all the actions. This is it right here. But as we begin reading these things, we begin saying, huh, open browser. I wonder what that does. Close browser. I wonder what that does, huh? Um, open tab, close tab. Clear browser cookies. Go to, go back, go forward. Title, click, double click. Drag and drop. Hover, right? Programmatically in each case, what we are doing here is interacting with the browser. And so if I want to learn more about any of these things, I can type in API like open browser. This is the first thing we're going to do here. And so we can see it gives me a lot of information about what I can do. Um, Tyco can be headless or headful. Um, uh, as I'm running Tyco in the REPL, we'll see that web browser will come up, Chromium will come up so we can see it. When I run Tyco from the command line in my CI CD pipeline, this runs headless and so it's incredibly fast to run. And when we talk about CI CD pipelines, how many of you have tried to set up a browser on your CI CD pipeline in a headless server environment with, you know, who knows what trying to do these kinds of things? And so Tyco makes it really easy. You can run it headless true or false. Um, you can control the actual window size as we go along here. This is really helpful for mobile testing, tablet testing, smart TV testing, everything in between. As a matter of fact, you can have it emulate specific devices as well. So if I wanted to, I could have it emulate an iPhone 10, or I could have it emulate a Pixel 3, or I could have it emulate whatever specific uh, device that I want. It really is just kind of screen sizing as we go along. Um, we even have the magic incantations we would need if we needed to turn around and run that in a uh, um, uh, Docker instance. So if I wanted to, I can come around here, I can say open browser, and in fact it's open. I can say go to wikipedia.org. I'm going to go to wikipedia.org. I'm going to click on the search field. I am going to enter behavior. What? Not AP. Not enter. What is it? Right. Excuse me. This is, you know, how it's live, right? And then we'll turn around and we will um, not click. We will press. enter, and then we're there in behavior-driven development. So we begin seeing this kind of stuff, and it's fun interacting with it in an actual REPL. What's especially fun is if you type in .code, we can see all of a sudden it's been paying attention to everything I typed in there, even the typos that I had. But it turned around and grabbed exactly that I've been typing in. Now that dumps it to the screen, but I can also type in .code test.js, and that will actually write it to the file system. So now this is something I can turn around and edit and begin using. But wait, there's more. If I turn around and type in .step, this makes it really easy to dump something out that's ready and able for Gage to consume. Notice that I've got a step in here right now with an empty string because that's what I need to match up to my markdown, but then everything else begins running. So I can also dump that out to the command line, dot step. And then as I exit, we can see there's my test.js right there. And I can also simply run it from the command line. In that case, we can see it ran headless. It ran that amount of time. And of course, this is reaching out to the real web as well. You could test your production website. You should. You should. Yeah. But you can also test your local host. You should. You really should. 
You can test your staging environment. Yes, please. You can test all of those kinds of things. As a matter of fact, it's trivial. If you set that node environment, that node env environment right there, you can plug in different URLs. You can plug in different user credentials. You can plug in different whatever connection strings you need to turn around and begin using this. And did you notice in that selector logic right there, I not once used an ID or a class selector. I can, as a matter of fact, um, if I get back into the Tyco REPL really quickly, and I know we're up on the edge of our time, but I just wanted to show you very quickly in here that I do have, oh yeah, that dollar sign selector in there as well. So I can turn around and do as deep nested awful selected logic as I want because of course I can right because this is what I can do in puppeteer this is what I can do in lighthouse this is what I can do in my Chrome DevTools right there but I tell people this is an anti-pattern just because you can do this you shouldn't do this because as a user journey test is your user gonna say I am going to click on this deep selected not logic in here or is the user gonna say eh, I'm gonna click on search and I type this in, I'm gonna press enter. And it may seem dirty as a developer that you're not being that specific, but in fact, can you see how by using that high level selector logic versus this very low level logic, that this adds resilience to your tests. I have actually seen Tyco tests survive a transition from React to a vanilla website. And the reason it worked is because we were doing this high-level user selector logic, not this low-level class logic, selecting individual elements or things like that. So in fact, the less specific you can be, the more resilient your tests are going to be, even across framework changes. And that's nothing that a unit test will be able to do for you. Nothing. You had a question earlier. Yeah. Magic! Okay. No, there's a lot of logic under the hood that's, that's trying to make those kinds of things there. But if you think about what a document uh, dot query selector, query selector all is doing, it's, it's essentially doing that, but it's doing it in a more fuzzy way. We're able to pull in strings. The other way around, I'm writing a test. I have a search box on my page somewhere. Yes. How do I make sure that if I type search in Tyco, it finds the right thing? So this is a very good question. So if all of a sudden I type in, I have Tyco select search and I'm not sure what it's going to select, I would argue, white box developer, that you shouldn't have two search IDs on your screen to begin with, right? If you know that it's search ID, that means it's unique. That means you're going to get it there, right? So it does turn around and make you kind of look at the structure of your HTML. And if you have poorly structured HTML, yeah, Tyco isn't going to work either. ID first, and then classes, and then field names, and then all number of things like that. When I say click search, it could be a button, it could be a hyperlink, it could be any number of other, it could be span with a click listener on it, right? And so the idea is there really is joy in the lack of specificity because it allows you to change the underlying implementation and still have the effects. But this is how you could be absolutely sure if you made sure that if you're running a test and it was weird, you got a search up here and Joe search showing up, your Jane search or something like that, you know. If you found things, you could get more specific as necessary. So I am right up on the edge of my time right here, but let's turn around now and just briefly take a look. This is all stuff that I live demoed for you right here, being able to go through, open up a browser. Hey, demo time, right? Yes, we did that already. But in review, so uh, this is the website that I uh, ran our tests through real quick, uh, uh, ConferenceWorks. Um, here are a set of tests that actually test that website if you want to see something a little bit more real. And all of these slides are available on my website thirstyhead.com, you can certainly uh, get there as well, thirstyhead.com slash conference works, um, and then that'll be how you can find your slides and you can find me as well. But if we start looking at these things, I put this up here because I wanted to give you an idea of what an actual real test suite looks like. And boy, we didn't even begin scratching the surface of Tyco. One of the things Tyco can do is intercept any calls 
So let's say that ConferenceWorks had Google Analytics in it, and I didn't want Google Analytics to get gummed up with my user journey tests. I can have Tycho intercept that call to Google Analytics and just dev null it, just throw it away. Or I could have it intercept and return its own mock data set. Or I could intercept that call and have it point to any other URL that I want. So we have a lot of flexibility in Tycho. Again, the high level DSL is what's meant to hook you, but this low level capability is where I'm living right now. And writing Tycho plugins are very easy as well. I'm working on a couple plugins right now. There are literally tens of lines of code, not hundreds or thousands, right? And so I'm doing things like trying to walk into a web page and see how many divs people are using. I want to walk into a web page and see what their accessibility score is based on what I see out of Lighthouse. These are all the kinds of things that we can begin doing when we have a good test tool available to us. So where does this leave us? Gage is a test runner that makes it easy to express your test in the language of your users. Tyco is a high-level browser driver, and these two together make it a lot of fun to do web testing. Did you enjoy yourself? I did as well. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I do appreciate it.